Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to NLS Live with our virtual planetarium all about the sky tonight. My name is Karen, and I will be acting as your moderator today. That just means that you will see my face briefly now, but mostly you'll just be listening to my voice. I'll be keeping an eye out for any of your questions, your observations, your comments, so I'll be able to share them with our lead educator today, who we will meet momentarily. But just a couple of housekeeping things here on Zoom. If you do have a question or an observation or a comment you would like to make, you can use the Q&A box. It should be at the bottom of your screen. Just click on that and type in your comment or question. If you do need closed captions today, you can find the CC button and choose show subtitles. Now, if you are watching on YouTube or Facebook Live, we so love that you are here checking out our show today. We hope you enjoy it, but we unfortunately cannot see the comments or questions from those platforms. So I think with that, I want to invite our lead educator to come on camera and introduce herself. Thanks, Karen. Hi, everybody. My name is Katie, and my pronouns are she and her. And today I'm going to be your educator as we talk about what is up in the sky tonight or this evening and a little bit of this morning, too. Um, so I'm going to switch over to our program today, and we are using a program called Stellarium. Um, I'm also going to briefly use another program as well, but I'll let you know when we're switching over. So right now I have this set to 6 p.m. tonight, so it's not as late as we usually go because there's something I want to point out um, that sets fairly early. So we're, we're looking at 6 p.m. tonight from around Boston, and we're currently facing the southwestern part of the sky. Now, this month is really exciting because there is an astronomical event um, that we don't get a chance to see too often, and that is the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn in the sky. So throughout the course of this year at nighttime, Jupiter and Saturn have both been very prominent and visible in the nighttime sky. And this month in particular, they're going to get as close as they can pretty much, um, or almost as close as they can from our perspective on earth. Now a conjunction happens, um, well, first of all, a conjunction is basically when we see two planets in the sky that look really close together. So it's kind of from our perspective here on the Earth. And a great conjunction happens when it's Jupiter and Saturn because they're the largest planets in the solar system. And this happens every 20 years or so. Um, so it's not quite as rare as a lot of headlines make it seem, but what's really unique about this one in particular is that we can actually see it, um, which is not always the case. So really close to the horizon down here in the southwestern part of the sky, you will see two very bright objects, uh, and those are Jupiter and Saturn. So I can click on Jupiter. We can zoom in a little bit. There we go. And you'll also be able to see a few of its moons as well. Its most prominent moons are the Galilean moons. And if you have a strong pair of binoculars or a back, uh, backyard telescope, you can see the moons along with Jupiter itself. And then close by, we have Saturn. Now, their closest approach is not right now. It's actually going to be in a couple of weeks, or actually a little bit less than that, on the 21st, which is also the winter solstice or the December solstice. Uh, and so here we have Saturn. You can see its rings. You can also see some of the moons around that planet as well. Now, the another reason that it's so exciting is not just the fact that we can't usually see this happen very often, but that it they haven't actually been this close in around observably this close in around 800 years. Um, so this is only today, by the way, but if we fast forward time a little bit and change our date so that it's uh, on the 21st, we can see what it will look like that night. All right, so now you can barely see a difference between the two. They're just kind of uh, one big blob. As we zoom in, you can start to resolve that they are two separate objects here. But if you're just looking up at the sky from, you know, 
just here on earth from anywhere um, in the city. If not in the city, it's going to be really, really bright. And you'll just basically see one fuzzy object. Um, and they're going to be about a tenth of a degree apart. So for reference, your pinky finger, if you were to hold that up to the sky, that's about one degree. And the moon is about a half a degree. So if you were to hold your pinky up to the moon during a full moon, it would cover, um, it would cover the whole thing and more. Um, so it would be about a fifth of the diameter of the moon. That's how close they're going to be in the sky. And I also want to show you what this would look like from space. So I will transfer over to the other program in just a second, but I want to pause and see if we've had any questions about it so far. Now that I've come in, I have a question or a clarification, I guess, Katie, Yeah. sort of just making it very clear that Jupiter and Saturn are no closer in actual space to each other than normal. It just really happens to be where we're standing. Like if you were standing, you know, in your front yard, looking at your lamppost and your front door, depending on how you move, they might sort of be closer or farther apart from each other. Same thing for Saturn and Jupiter, correct? Exactly, yeah. So it's not that they're actually very close together in space. It's just that they look very close together from our perspective on the surface of the Earth. That's a very good clarifying point. And we did just have a question come yeah. in um, about which planet is closer to us, I guess, at this point in history. Yeah, so out of these two, Jupiter is the closer one to the Earth. So if you think about the order of the planets, we have the Sun in the middle, and then we have Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. So Jupiter is the closer of the two. Um, it's about a half a billion miles away from the Sun, whereas Saturn is almost double that. So it's actually a lot farther away than Jupiter is. But let's move over to Worldwide Telescope. So we just had two questions come in yeah. about that before we move on to Worldwide sure. Telescope. Um, somebody asked, you can. You said you can see this from anywhere on December 21st, question mark. So I guess maybe clarifying the direction to look and make sure you have a clear sky. Yeah, awesome um, clarification question. So let's go back to Stellarium. And then it, somebody, Paul, who's nine, also asked sort of as a follow-up also, will they look like big stars or will they be a slightly different color? Great questions. Yeah, so the best place to look for them is going to be low in the southwest, western part of the sky. So you can see if we back up here a little bit, you'll see that it's kind of in between uh, west and southwest. So in the direction of where the sun sets. Um, and then it will look like a very just fuzzy, bright object in the sky. Um, it'll be a lot brighter than a star, even the brightest star, it'll appear brighter than that. Um, and then as for a color, I'm not sure that it's going to look a particular color. Um, neither of these planets really show uh, prominent colors, you know, when they're just on their own, but uh, that'll be a really interesting thing to observe when it actually happens, but I predict that it will probably just look like a fuzzy ball of light that might resemble a star, but a very, very, very bright star. And with a good pair of binoculars, I wonder if you can make it look a little bit more like that, like bare eyes, just one blob, but with a strong pair of binoculars, I bet you can make it look like two blobs squished together. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, even if, if you have really good eyesight or, um, you know, great glasses or contacts, you might still be able to see a little bit of a difference between the two. Um, it won't be like a perfect match necessarily, but yeah, with binoculars, you should easily be able to see um, that both of them are there and they're just separated by a teeny, teeny, tiny amount. Again, a tenth of a degree. So if we take a look at what that is going to look like from space, so this kind of helps give you another idea of what's going, what exactly is going on in the solar system that makes this happen. So right now we're looking at kind of a top-down view of the solar system. We've got the sun right here in the middle, then Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars. We come out this way, we've got Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune, and this also included Pluto here. Um, that's that kind of wonky white orbit line out there. Um, but if we zoom in a little bit here, and 
just a heads up, I have enlarged everything that you're looking at right now. So the sun is extra big, the planets are extra big, just so that you can see them a little bit better. So right at the crosshair is where the Earth is in its orbit around the sun. And you can actually see the orbit of the moon as well going around the Earth. And then we have the orbits of Jupiter right over here and Saturn, which is right up here. Oh, it's hard for me to point at it without this covering it up. Um, so if we zoom in to the Earth, and we imagine that we, well, we don't have to imagine that we're on the surface of the Earth, <laughs> because we are, um, we can see what they look like from this perspective. And let me get rid of some of those orbit lines really quick, just to make it a little easier to see here. Get rid of that. That's really cool, Katie. Yeah, so now from this perspective, you can see that they are just, they just happen to line up. Their orbits are basically in, in line with each other. And because of where the Earth is in its orbit around the sun, we're able to see this alignment happen. So if we're on the surface of the Earth, imagine we're on the other side there, um, we can see how close they get. Now this is tonight, but if we were to kind of fast forward time to the 21st, we would see it a little bit more like that. So you can see them that are basically just right on top of each other. But they're not actually any closer in space, right? They're still in their normal orbits around the sun. They just happen to line up. Now, if you could imagine that this happened when the Earth was over here, so that they're basically in a straight line, that would be like the ultimate conjunction, right? They'd be, they'd look like they're right on top of each other. But the problem with that is if the earth is over here on this side of the sun, um, that we would only be able to see that during the day. And because the sun's in the way, we wouldn't actually be able to see that happen. So the fact that we're not on the opposite side of the sun, we're just kind of offset a little bit, allows us to actually see the conjunction happen. And also, by the time the Earth ends up over here, Jupiter and Saturn are also going to be moving in their orbits. So they won't, you know, line up quite as perfectly as they will appear this month. And you said this happens every 20 years. When was the first time this was noticed? That is a really good question. Um, and I'm actually not sure. So the the planets out up to Saturn are all visible with the naked eye. So it's hard to say when, you know, when was the first time that humans looked up and saw the planets in the sky or, or noticed that they weren't stars or something like that. Um, because people have just been able to see it. So you can't really put a, a timestamp on when on when exactly was the the time that the planets were these planets were discovered? Um, so I imagine it's something similar where you know observers on Earth just looked up and saw the two planets close together in the sky. Um, I'm not exactly sure when you know the terminology came in into it, like conjunction, great conjunction, that kind of stuff, um, and when it was started or. When it started being recorded, I'm also not sure about, but that's a and good it's not question. Like it happens instantaneously. Like if you were to go out every night for the next week and a half before the 21st, you'd see them getting closer and closer together. So I'm sure our ancient ancestors noticed that too. And then suddenly there was a day where it's like, wow, bam, this is cool. They look like they morphed into one. I wonder what's going on. Exactly. Yep. And you'll be able to still see the planets for a while after the conjunction. They'll still appear close in the sky. I mean, this whole year, really, they've been relatively close in the sky. This will just be um, the point of maximum closeness. All right, so let's go back to Stellarium. Um, and also next week's The Sky Tonight, um, we'll also talk about the conjunction because we'll be a lot closer to that date on next Friday. And I think a little bit about the solstice also. Yes, absolutely. It is the winter solstice, which is the shortest day of the year um, and the start of the winter time up here in the Northern Hemisphere. All right, so I am just turning us back to <laughs> today's date 
and I'm going to bring us to, well, we can go to about maybe nine o'clock or so, or I guess it gets dark really early nowadays, so we can stop whenever. Um, and actually, I wanted to look at the morning sky because there are a couple of cool things that you can see in the morning as well. But before we do that, are there any questions? Uh, there's a couple that are still talking about um, the planets. So CJ, who's five, wants to know what makes the Earth and the planets orbit around the sun in a circle? And then Jack asks, can all the planets line up? I think those kind of go together. Yeah, so the planets are orbiting the sun because of gravity. Anything that is made up of stuff or matter um, also has gravity, a force of gravitation. So the sun is really, 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 really big. It's very massive. So it has a lot of gravity. Um, the earth also has gravity. That's why we can stand on the surface of the earth, just not as much as the sun. So you can kind of think of it like they're almost you know, at, like tethered to the sun and they're just kind of stuck in orbit because of the sun's gravity. Um, so they just keep going around and around and around and around. They're trying to go straight, but the sun just keeps pulling them all back. Exactly. Yeah. So it's, it's all because of gravity. Um, and then the other question about if the planets all line up, that does happen. Um, I think that the last time it happened might have been like eight years ago or so. I'm not sure how frequently that happens because all of the different planets orbit the sun at different speeds and they're at different distances away. So while the earth, you know, takes one year to orbit, the farther out you go, it takes many, many years for like Saturn and Jupiter to orbit the sun once. Jupiter takes 12 years to go around the sun once. So you, all of that has to kind of line up perfectly and so does not happen very often. Um, but it definitely does happen. And just one more about the motion of the planets before we move on. Why are the orbits of the planets and their moons all in the same direction? That is a really good question as well. So that kind of has to do with how the solar system formed. So four and a half billion years ago or so, that's how old we estimate the solar system to be. Um, the sun was very young. It was a brand new star. And there's a lot of material, basically like a giant cloud of gas and dust swirling around the the baby sun. And so over time, that material clumped together to form planets and moons and, you know, asteroids and other things that you'd find in the solar system. And since that initial cloud um, was kind of all orbiting around in the same direction, anything that came out of that cloud just continued in that direction. It's just angular momentum, essentially. It's just going to keep going in that direction forever unless something changes it. So uh, most of the planets as viewed from above orbit counterclockwise, um, but we look at Venus, for example, or excuse me, not orbit, um, rotate. So like day and night, they rotate counterclockwise, but we look at Venus and it turns out Venus is actually rotating very, very slowly in the opposite direction. So that means that there must have been, you know, some interaction between large objects in the solar system that caused the change in angular momentum. So in general, most things kind of follow that counterclockwise rotational and orbit motion. Um, but, you know, there are some objects that are a little bit different because of additional interactions after the formation of the solar system. Well, cool. Thank you for that, Katie. I know we have a lot more to get to and not a lot of time. So that's no worries. Questions are great. So if you have more, keep them coming. Um, all right. So let's fast forward time even more. We're going to go to very early in the morning. We'll go to around sunrise, which I believe is just before 7 a.m. Go a little faster here. All right, we went a little too far. <laughs> it's <laughs> nice when you can put the earth in reverse, right? <laughs> I know, right? Very handy. All right, so we're at about 6.30. And if we look over in the southeastern part of the sky, there are a couple of objects uh, that you might recognize. So 
If you know what one or both of them are, go ahead and type it into the chat. If you have no idea what one of them is or both of them are, that's okay too. You can just say that you're unsure, but type in some guesses, some answers. Still waiting. Well, one of them, I think we're all pretty oh, The moon with. is one. We got two votes for a moon. <laughs> Moon and Mars, the moon, the moon. The moon and Venus, says Zachary, who is eight. Uh, Jupiter, the moon. So we think it's the moon and a planet, I think is general consensus. Yeah, that's correct. So the moon, very familiar to most of us, I would say. Um, and we can zoom in a little bit. You can see it in greater detail. Um, you can see the moon very early in the morning, but it will appear just as a crescent, right? So we're only seeing just a sliver of the daytime side of the moon. But you'll also notice that even though that's the part that's lit up, you can actually still see the nighttime side of the moon quite a bit here. And that's something that's really cool about observing the moon when it's visible in the early morning or even at dusk, if it's, you know, whenever it's visible at dusk. And that's because it's actually reflecting a little bit of what's called earth shine. So planets, moons, they reflect light from the star that they orbit. So that's why we see this little lit up side of the moon. It's not because the moon is making light itself, but it's because the moon is reflecting light from the sun. And so the earth does that as well. The earth reflects light from the sun. And at this time of the day, the earth reflects light, but we can actually see a little bit of that light, right? Because the sun is still below the horizon. It's not outshining anything really in the sky just yet. Um, a little bit, you know, the, the other stars and things like that. But um, this, the nighttime side of the moon is just slightly visible because of the reflected sunlight bouncing off of the earth and then onto the moon's surface. And we call that earth shine, which is kind of a fun term. And then this other object right here is indeed a planet. This is the planet Venus. And we can click on it and zoom in and get a closer look. So Venus happens to be the third brightest object in the sky when it's visible after the sun and the moon. Um, Venus is the, in general, the closest planet to the Earth. Um, if you were to compare the distance between their orbits. And you'll notice that Venus also goes through phases. So there's a little bit of a sliver here that's dark, but we're actually seeing most of the lit up side of Venus. And the reason that we see Venus phases is because it is an inferior planet. And I don't mean inferior as in like <laughs> a worse planet. It's definitely not, Venus is awesome a lot of cool stuff about it. Uh, but inferior means that its orbit is closer to the sun than Earth's orbit is. So if we were observing from Mars, for example, Earth would be considered an inferior planet. It's basically any planet that's closer to the sun from where you're observing. And then on the opposite side of things, a superior planet is just anything outside of that. So like, you know, Mars, any of the gas giants from our perspective on Earth are superior planets. So Venus, because its entire orbit is closer to the sun, um, we see different parts of it lit up in its orbit around the sun. So right now, most of Venus, we can see most of its daytime side. And because Venus is, has a really thick atmosphere, it reflects a lot of sunlight, which helps um, make it appear very, very bright in the sky when it's visible. So you can see that really early in the morning at, you know, uh, anytime, I guess it's 630 right now, and it's fairly high in the sky. So you can probably see it um, even before this time as well. So that's what's going on in the morning sky. Any questions about the moon or Venus? Not any yet, but somebody earlier asked, how far in the future are you able to simulate and how far in the past? So using Stellarium or other programs. 
Yeah, so I haven't tried to test its limits, but I do know that you can go like thousands of years in the past and, you know, we can, let's try it. Um, let's see, let's go to... Ancient Egypt? Yeah, so... Can you what, do BC in that, here? That's a good question. I don't think I, I'm not sure how to change it. I wonder if I could just do like negative. <laughs> negative. Maybe we do the year two since that's yeah. what's there. Let's do two. Um, and then it does, none of the rest really matters. So, okay, we're looking right now the year two. So this is. So we just gone back 2,000 years. and 18 years ago. <laughs> yeah. And you can probably go back farther. Um, I just don't exactly know how to type in. BCE times. It could just be a negative. I don't know. Um, this is a free program. So if you want to play around with it on your own, um, you can totally do that. The link is going to be available at the end of the show. It's stellarium.org. So if you want to see it and then into the future, I also don't know um, how far it can go. That one is a little bit easier to test because, you know, we can just add zeros. So this is... This is in the year 20,000. So you can go many thousands of years at least um, and see the sky. And it's all based on, you know, what we think of how the sky moves and the galaxies expanding and this, that, and the other. So these simulations, if you lived until the year 20,000, I think that's what year we're in right now. Yeah. Um, it wouldn't necessarily look like this, but with current scientific knowledge, this is what we think the sky should look like. Yeah, and generally, we're pretty good at predicting um, what things will look like because we have a good idea of how the Earth orbits and how the other planets are orbiting and the kind of minute motions that the Earth goes through over thousands of years. So it, it's probably pretty accurate. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's a pretty good simulation and things could change too. So I think we're almost out of time. Maybe time for a couple of questions, if any questions have come in so far. Well, I like this one. Um, it's one of our younger friends that's thinking about the future. So Montserrat wants to know, if I'm 10 now, the next time Jupiter and Saturn are in conjunction will be when I'm 30? Yes, that is correct. Um, Estimated, I, of course. Yeah, I don't think that that one will be visible. I think the next visible conjunction will happen in the year 2080. So if you want to see it happen from the surface of the earth, you're going to have to wait much longer. Uh, you'll be a lot older in the year 20. I'll be 99 years old that year. <laughs> <laughs> I can only hope to live that long healthily. <laughs> yes, me too. Last one before we wrap up. Um, how cold is the moon? Yeah, another great question. So the moon is very cold because it doesn't have an atmosphere. So atmospheres kind of act like blankets where they trap in heat and they keep you nice and cozy, right? So on Earth, we've got um, a very decent atmosphere. It's perfect for us and it traps in just enough heat so that we don't get too hot um, or too cold. And the moon doesn't have an atmosphere. So it's just kind of exposed to the space environment. So it's very, very cold. Um, you know, we're talking negative hundreds of degrees, but also sometimes it can get really, really hot randomly if there's a whole bunch of, you know, radiation from the sun in one particular pocket, um, it can get really high temperatures. So it's kind of crazy, but in general, extremely cold. So awesome and so cool. I love... I love everything about space. I could talk about it day in and day out. Um, but I want to thank Katie and hopefully everybody will give you a nice silent cheer for sharing the sky tonight and a lot about planets. It was fun kind of learning mm -hmm. about planets and certainly check back next week and we might talk more about the solstice and the conjunction as well as some of the constellations. We do uh, these virtual planetarium sky tonight shows every Friday afternoon. So definitely check that out. But thank you, Katie. Um, and we'll Thanks see so you much. again at another one of these. Sounds good. And for the rest of you, I hope that you had fun learning about the planets. And as Katie said, the program that she was using is called Stellarium. 
or Stellarium. It is a free program. You can download it. You can explore it yourself. It's a really fun program to kind of work with and predict what it might look like on your 99th birthday if you were to go outside at night. So I hope you had fun. You learned a few new things. Definitely check out our other virtual programs uh, here through the Museum of Science website. And if you are willing and able to do so, we would love to the support the support from you guys so we can continue doing programs like this. So thank you and have a great rest of your Friday.